people do not understand our banking and monetary system. If they did, there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. Money is a tool for trading human time. Central banks, the modern era masters of money, wield this tool as a weapon to steal time and inflict wealth inequality. History shows us that the corruption of monetary systems leads to moral decay, social collapse, and slavery. As the temptation to manipulate money has always proven to be too strong for mankind to resist, the only antidote for this poison is an incorruptible money, Bitcoin. Counterfeiters are slave masters. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave, Frederick Douglass. In ancient Western Africa, agri beads, small decorative glass beads, were used as money for many centuries. When European explorers appeared in Africa in the 16th century, it was quickly apparent to them that agri beads were highly valued by African locals. Since glassmaking technology in Africa was primitive at the time, agri beads were difficult to produce and, therefore, reliably scarce relative to other goods. Back in Europe, glassmaking technology was more sophisticated. Counterfeit beads virtually identical to agri beads could be mass produced at a low cost. As European ships arrived on African shores, many with hulls packed full of glass beads, locals readily traded their hard earned assets for what they believed were precious agri beads. Spanning the course of decades, this trading of real assets for counterfeit beads facilitated a surreptitious confiscation of African wealth by Europeans, a slow motion criminal episode that crippled African society for centuries to come. Agri beads would later become known as slave beads. As newly impoverished Africans became desperate, some were forced to sell themselves or others as slaves to their European usurpers. Slave beads, one of history's many monetary systems weaponized by counterfeiters, became instrumental in the multi-century transatlantic slave trade. Over the course of 365 years, over 12 and a half million slaves were transited from Africa to Europe and the Americas. In a barbaric irony of history, ships landing in Africa stuffed with counterfeit agri beads were later departed for European and American shores with full payloads of precious human cargo. Unfortunately, this pillaging of wealth was not an isolated episode. Cloth strips were another form of money used in ancient Africa, which became a well-established transactional medium over many centuries of dealing with Muslim traders from the north. Local African tribes soon began producing these cloth strips, known colloquially as panos, but were outcompeted by the more efficient production methods employed by the Portuguese. A perversely profitable economic arrangement ensued in which the Portuguese used panos to purchase African slaves who were then put to work producing the very cloth strips with which their freedom was stolen. Lured by a virtually limitless profit potential, Portuguese panos producers soon established a state-sponsored monopoly. This company enforced the use of panos for tax payments to forcibly denominate slave trade contracts and to hire soldiers. To name just one similar non-coincidental example today, the U.S. government enforces the use of dollars for tax collections as legal tender, as the nominal currency for contracts on oil, the energy slave of modernity, and as the international reserve currency. Events strikingly similar to agri beads and panos are playing out today throughout the global economy. The U.S. dollar in your pocket the one you sacrificed so much to obtain, was recently mass-produced by the U.S. government with a near-effortless keystroke. In the same way Europeans had access to superior glass-making technology that gave them the ability to counterfeit money at a low cost, or the Portuguese monopolized panos production, central banks have an exclusive privilege to produce money at near zero cost, enabling them to confiscate wealth from all users of dollars at will. History of human action related to agribeads and panos hold important lessons for society suffering under central banking. Those who can monopolize money production become de facto currency counterfeiting operations that steal human labor in perpetuity. When free market forces are manipulated, producers gain an asymmetric ability to set prices without regard to customer preferences, thereby converting economic democracies into dictatorships and freedom into tyranny. For money, this implies monopolists can acquire human time, also known as labor, 
in the marketplace at an unfair price. Said differently, money monopolists can steal human time, a malevolent power that effectively makes them slave masters. Step one in this vicious cycle of money monopolization is to monopolize money production and tax collection. Step two is to use the cheaply produced money to buy assets and hire soldiers. Step three, after impoverishing trading partners, conquer or enslave them. Step four, force slaves to work in money production facilities. Finally, step five, violently suppress any competitors in money production to preserve the monopoly. Counterfeit agar beads and panos were weapons used to acquire human time, acts which led to the direct theft of 12 and a half million human lives between 1501 and 1806, and the indirect theft of their progeny. The transatlantic slave trade was a slow motion holocaust on Africans. Roughly 2 million died in transit through the infamous Middle Passage, and those who survived spent the rest of their waking lives toiling away or bearing children to replenish their slave master's stock. Quantifying this atrocity from an economic perspective, not counting those born into slavery, assuming the average slave could labor 5,000 hours each year for 40 years, the staggering total time stolen amounts to over 2.5 trillion hours or 6.8 billion hours stolen per year for 365 years. Markets, Sovereignty, and Morality Competition is a natural process of discovery. In free markets, competition is the set of games played to discover satisfactions of wants. Each entrepreneur places bets, or investments, of capital, money, and time as they attempt to prove their competitors wrong in the marketplace by delivering better, faster, or cheaper solutions to the problems their customers want solved. Market competition is the catalyst of honest work and true progress for civilization. Points in market-based games of discovery are denominated in money, the tool used to calculate, negotiate, and execute trades most effectively. Market competition is the process that keeps producers honest. When it is suppressed through coercion or violence, as it is within legal monopolies, truth becomes distorted into inaccurate prices, low quality tools, and individual wickedness. For money producers, monopolization means dishonest producers become counterfeiters and gain a deceptive and violent dominion over human time. Contrary to conventional wisdom, money is not the root of all evil. It is actually just a tool for trading time or labor, the means by which market participants signify sacrifices and successes to one another across the history of economic transactions. Like all tools, money has no independent morality of its own. Tools are amoral, meaning they can be used for both good and evil purposes alike. The moral outcome of using a tool is inextricably dependent on the intention of its user. Money is a temporal trading tool, but As we've seen, it can also be wielded maliciously to steal time in the same way a hammer can be used to build a house or bash a skull. More accurately, money, along with its precursors, action and speech, is the root of all sovereignty, the authority to act in the world as one sees fit. At the foundation of Western civilization today is the precept that the sovereignty of the individual is held higher than that of the state an embodied belief at the heart of legal principles such as habeas corpus, the presumption of innocent until proven guilty, and freedom of speech rights. Freedom of speech is essential to a peaceful society, as our ideas must be free to clash and resolve conflicts so that our bodies don't. Speech arose in humans as a direct result of our evolutionary development. Money may be considered a form of speech in and unto itself, the language of value. Placing limitations on the use of this language, the purpose of central banks, is commensurately catastrophic to restricting the freedom of speech. Free speech digs the grave for despotism, whereas its suppression is the trademark of totalitarian regimes. Indeed, the first effort of every aspiring dictator is always to restrict the voice of dissent. For money, governments corrupt the pricing mode of comparative expression by constantly violating the supply of money via inflation, while simultaneously compelling its demand via legal tender and tax collection laws. 
Distorting natural price discovery, a manipulation of the collective logos, is equivalent to perverting the vox populi, the voice of the people. George Orwell once said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. An inability to speak the truth with words or prove others wrong in the marketplace with prices is the death of liberty. As the 20th century so painfully taught us, restricting the logos is a slippery slope toward totalitarianism. Like speech, money lacks an intrinsic morality of its own. However, its economic character does influence moral standards. As Buddha taught us, money is the worst discovery of human life, but it is the most trusted material to test human nature. Honest money encourages righteous action, and dishonest money induces moral hazard. To comprehend money's impact on morality, consider the hypothetical case of a winemaker living in a centrally banked economy. He knows that his central bank recently doubled the money supply by printing trillions of dollars to quote unquote save the economy, and is now faced with three options. Option one. The winemaker can continue selling his wine for $20, knowing that the value of each dollar has declined 50% due to inflation. Option two, the winemaker can water down his wine or use cheaper ingredients, thereby decreasing the production cost and quality of his wine, but continues selling it for $20. Option three, the winemaker can double the selling price of his wine to $40 to get the same value for his wine denominated in post-inflation dollars. If the winemaker chooses the first option, he incurs a 50% loss. If he decides to water down his wine, he defrauds his customers by selling them an inferior product. If he doubles his price to maintain quality, he risks losing customers to less honest competitors who are willing to compromise on quality. Since diluting wine with water is difficult to detect for non-connoisseurs and offers an immediate financial gain, all winemakers face strong incentives to defraud their customers when inflation strikes, a cause of a wine scandal. In a similar vein, monetary inflation incentivizes sellers across all industries to deceive their customers. Inflation imposes the temptation of larceny onto sellers' hearts, forcing them to weigh financial well-being against moral integrity. In this way, inflation is an infectious disease to society's moral fabric. Inflation-resistant money, then, is an antidote to an afflicted social morality. In this critically important sense, Bitcoin, the only money with a 0% terminal inflation rate, is the cure for many of the moral cancers riddling our world. Since everything in the marketplace requires sacrifices of human time to produce, even land needs hands to sell, we can say that money is human time emblematized. In the same way a stock certificate is titled a company capital, money is titled to human time. People sacrifice time earning money, which they can then spend on commensurate sacrifices from others. Clearly, a tool that can command human time is an object of great temptation, as it is a potent source of power. Natural money has been hijacked by artificial tyrants. The reason we call states sovereign today is entirely because they are the gangs that reign over the world's freely chosen money, gold. The so-called sovereign states. For over 5,000 years, precious metals have been favored as money since they best fulfilled its five properties, divisibility, durability, portability, recognizability, and scarcity. Gold came to reign supreme because of all the monetary metals, it was the most scarce. Scarcity is arguably the most important property of money as without an assurance of supply limitation, someone always gives in to the temptation to inflate and steal the value stored therein. C agri beads, panos cloth money, or fiat currencies today. Governments have always interceded in the market for money to commandeer gold coinage and warehousing operations. By monopolizing these certification function businesses, the state shifted the burden of trust from transacting parties unto itself. States throughout history have always made it their exclusive business to certify the value, the weight or fineness of money and money substitutes. All national currencies began as paper promises for real money. Today, these currencies are no longer redeemable for real money and instead have been transformed into perennially unfulfilled promises called fiat currencies. 
Governments require societies to transact in these money substitutes and reserve the exclusive right to manipulate their supplies as a means of siphoning wealth, also known as stealing time, from citizens. In effect, fiat currencies are uncollateralized debts undergoing slow motion default while their use is forced on society. All the while, central banks continue to hoard the real money, gold, and perform final settlement with one another in this authentic, free market selected medium of exchange. Seen this way, printing money actually refers to currency counterfeiting, the production of false promises, as currencies are no longer tied to real money. Said simply, fiat currency is a living lie. Manipulating money supplies is objectively useful for only one thing, inflicting wealth inequalities by stealing time. In war times, belligerent nations have made attempts to counterfeit opponent currencies to cause hyperinflation. For example, Nazi Germany had plans to bomb England with counterfeit banknotes to sabotage their economy. And in Imperial Japan, the Norbito Laboratory experimented with currency counterfeiting operations as an economic subversion strategy. Of course, when circumstances become too uncertain, market participants naturally flock back to the trust minimization of physical gold, since money substitutes are, at best, promises to receive money in the future. They are vulnerable to default. The self-declared sovereign state is a business model built on the confiscation of self-sovereign monies like gold and silver. The superior monetary properties of gold made it the most valuable form of self-sovereign money in history, a reign it has maintained since before the founding of ancient Egypt. In the next part, we'll talk about the greatest pyramid scheme of all time. If you want to see more Bitcoin essays converted into mini documentaries, go check out Power Laws, the guys who produced this video.